Okay, welcome to this next element of the overall learning resource, exploring ways for you to develop conference posters. You'll notice from the overview of this Prezi here that we'll start off by looking at the intended learning outcomes, what you can expect to achieve by working through the whole of this resource. Also looking at ways in which your poster can stand out, looking at ways in which, um, especially if you're displaying your poster along with so many others, how is it going to be that people will want to be drawn in and have a look at your poster? Um, also then exploring uh, aspects of your audience, because there may be different audiences that you're aiming for, and sometimes even um, audiences behind audiences. So that's going to be a crucial point for us to analyse, and also then to look at some of the benefits of uh, producing conference posters and even if you feel a little bit nervous about uh, standing there and presenting it's going to be a great opportunity for you to learn some new skills. If I'd been presenting this uh, presentation in class over this last decade or so then I would have started off with this wonderful picture of the University of Greenwich, the old Royal Naval College, um, because I actually laid down in the grass to take that photograph through all of those uh, daffodils. I'm always happy for you to contact me, and especially by Twitter. It would be fantastic if you do get accepted to show your posters at conferences. Get someone to take a photograph of you uh, standing next to the poster, and feel free to tweet me and tell about your successes. And I'm always happy to share that with so many others, so feel free to uh, uh, share those ideas. When it comes to our intended learning outcomes, there are four that I'd want us to consider on here. And the first one, of course, is starting off with achieving excellence. Aim for excellence in what you're doing. I've already told you in an earlier video about how I started doing these presentations because I'd seen some really poor examples of posters. So hopefully by working through this resource, you'll never end up in that situation. So you must look at, um, seeing that there's a real need to produce very high quality uh, uh, de uh, demonstrations and disseminations of your work. So it means that you need to look at the guidelines, what the different conferences require of you, and then do your best to achieve those to the full. It's also a great opportunity for you to share what's called your academic citizenship. And that means for you to get known, for you to network um, and be known in the wider peer community within which you work. So whether that's specific um, clinical pathways or educational pathways, who are your peers and therefore who are you talking to when you're presenting your posters? And that's a way for you to get known to boost your academic uh, citizenship. It's also important that you customise your posters, so you can't just design one now, say by working through this workshop, and you might have an idea of a poster you want to do, and then you design that poster and think, right, which conference can I go to and show this poster? Because it may not be presented in exactly the way that they want. So you must look at each individual conference, assess their audience, what is it that audience um, needs to know and wants to know, and what's the format for doing the presentations. So you must do what it says on the tin there. You must follow their particular guidelines. And of course, this is giving you a great opportunity to share your learning or your research with other peers, maybe in your own specialist field of practice or in wider academia. So a really good way of raising your profile for others to know you. Now, when it comes to considering your audience, I'd say there are three main considerations that we need to look at here. First of all, ask yourself, is it the general public that you're aiming to show your poster to? So it may be that you want to design a poster to go up in your practice setting. So it may be your clients or your patients or um, health promotion initiatives that you want to get the message out to the general population. And if that's so, there are certain things that you need to remember here. So any um, 
technical words, always spell them out, make them simpler, make them understandable to people. Because when you consider the average reading age in, um, in the UK or whichever country you're in, think of the average reading age and even the technical language you use in your research studies or your professional life may be um, the wrong type of language to use for the general population. So that's really important. And also be considerate for um, um, equality, diversity and inclusion. Even when you're using images, if you're only showing people of a certain gender or certain age, certain abilities, certain ethnicities, then ask yourself, who are you excluding by this? So look at ways of including people rather than excluding. And even with your words, make sure that you're not being um, disrespectful of anyone and trying your best to be inclusive of all. And also it may be important, well it is important, to think of wider intersectionality as well. So differences that people have, maybe because of their socio-economic groups or um, uh, maybe their uh, ethnicities, the communities they come from, maybe particular religions. There are lots of things that impact on individuals in different ways, so it is important to consider uh, wider uh, intersectionality. If you're considering going to two different types of conferences, one may be scientific, such as medical conferences, others may be more to do with professional groups. So again, you've got to follow the guidelines of what the specific conference wants, and that's also going to dictate to you how many words you use on your posters, what sort of graphic images you can use. Um, so you must um, assess the audience that you're going for and follow those guidelines to know exactly how to design your poster right from the start. And sometimes you may even be thinking of an audience by proxy, and I'll cover this in a later video on this Spark page, but it may be that you go into a particular conference where you're showing a poster that's meant to be for the clients or the patients of the people attending. So say for example, um, if you wanted to design a poster addressing old people who go to general practice settings, but maybe you're doing your presentation to general practitioners or general practice nurses. So the audience you've got present may be different ones to the um, intended audience of the poster. So again, as part of your rationale of why you've developed the poster, you may have to say, well, look, I've developed this for your specific client group, but then you give the wider academic background to that as you present it uh, within a particular conference. The next issue is to get noticed. And one of the ways I talk about this is uh, um, um, the wow factor. So how can you have a wow factor your, to your poster? Now, sometimes that's difficult because with certain academic conferences, they may want posters to look very much the same as each other and there's not much opportunity for you to develop a wow factor. But in a way, you are walking a bit of a tightrope here. Say, for example, if you were presenting a poster at a conference that was looking at the objectification of female bodies in the media, then using an image like you see on the screen at the moment may be very appropriate. You may be using this as an example of what you want to talk about. On the other hand, if you're going to be using images that are just gratuitous, you're just putting them in there to try and shock people, for example, then that may have exactly the opposite effect. Rather than drawing people in to look at your uh, poster, you might, might offend people. But what I mentioned a moment ago about walking the tightrope, that is the tightrope you have to walk. Because sometimes the message you want to convey may be controversial, may be painful, might be difficult for people to consider. So you don't want to go overboard and offend people and push them away, but sometimes you do have to raise um, issues that others may not want to talk about. And also, especially if we were doing this in a workshop and doing it in a classroom together, online or physically, um, you'd have others around you to check this out with. So because you're accessing this learning resource uh, differently now, then yes, it's going to be important for you to uh, check it out with others. Make sure they understand exactly what it is that you're saying. Because this image, for example, um, 
you may look at the text in English and think to yourself, oh, it means don't touch yourself, don't touch yourself physically. Um, in fact, it's nothing to do with that. This was a sign above a fruit and veg stall. And what the, uh, the, uh, the people were asking was that you don't touch the fruit and veg yourself, let the, um, uh, the service personnel help you with it. So it's good to get somebody else to check out to make sure that the language you're using is really appropriate there. Now, some of the benefits of conference presentations. First of all, there's peer reviews. Others are going to be able to see your work. And that starts off by sending in the abstract in the first place. Most conferences will have a call for abstracts and they've got specific ways in which they must be written. So it's important that you follow that way. Otherwise, you may just fall at the first hurdle. So you write the abstract, Quite often the abstracts are then published in a book of abstracts. They may be made available online. So the company or the conference may give a DOI, a digital object identifier number to it. So you can put all of that onto your CV or you may want to generate a QR code uh, from this and show that again on your CV. Also, if you upload the, the abstract, the poster, maybe a presentation onto your ResearchGate profile, that's going to boost your ResearchGate score as well. You've also got the opportunity to produce some handouts as well. Maybe it's a leaflet to explain more about the poster, especially if the poster's got lots of images on it with few words, and maybe no references. So you might want to design a little leaflet to go along with this that will contain all of the other elements as well. So I'd say to you go for the same image on the front cover and then inside that's when you can um, uh, write other things and put the references in for example. You might also want to put your business cards around or leave your contact details, social media um, is a really good way of getting other people to build up networks, that's your academic citizenship, and of course using those little QR codes. You've also got the opportunity then to stand by your posters. So in most conferences, during the, 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 the various breaks, that's when you'd have the opportunity to go and stand near the, the posters and be able to talk to other people as they pass by. So engage others, uh, look at ways in which you can actually start sharing your learning with them. And you never know, you may come across an expert that's been taught, uh, that, that's um, at the conference who's who's written some of the materials you've read for the development of your poster. So it'd be wonderful for you to get into conversation with them, a really great opportunity. And obviously with many of the big conferences, you get the chance to present as well. Um, as you can see, I do tend to talk a lot and I can see the time is running quickly on this video. So I've got to finish fairly quickly, but that's a great opportunity. Uh, at the big conferences, you may be given say 15 minutes and it could be first thing in the morning before the main conference starts, they might have presentation of the posters, say between eight till 10 in the morning. So different themes in different groups. So you stand there with your poster um, and then maybe do a PowerPoint or a Prezi to actually present your poster to an audience that's ready to, uh, to be there listening to you. So a wonderful way of disseminating your research. And this is it now. I'll finish the video here because it's over to you. As you move down the Spark page, you'll see that the next video is the elements that I would have been doing in class as the workshop. And that means you've got to do some work for that. Okay, thanks for listening and carry on learning.